heard the phrase. I thought, that's for me. My meditation that you do, but there's some version of it that you can do when you're going around. Maybe that would work. And uh, it did work for me. It worked Because I would do things like, you know, having my... No. So this kind of meditation isn't just about observation. I'm talking about the second thing here, which is something to do with anything that you can do to put yourself in the present tense. There's all kinds of versions of it. Douglas Hines is <coughs> seeing. You're in, to be seeing, you're in the present tense. So I, I began to think of it as starving the ego out of existence. Um, it couldn't. If you're in the present, you're not thinking about the future, and you're not worrying about the past or whatever it is. You're in the present tense. And every time that you're there, even for a second or for half a second, and, and aware that you're in the present tense, it's like it has taken a bit of energy out of the ego. That was, that was how I thought of it. And following the breath, um, the power of now, Eckhart Tolle. I mean, I could probably, <coughs> I, I, if I sat making a list of them, in it, I used to do things like uh, observing the sensations in the body. The sensations in the body are always present tense. If you are sitting there and you're conscious of what's going on in your gosh or if you have a pain in your knee and you're conscious of it, it's present tense. So long as, of course, you're not thinking, oh, this awful pain in my knee, you know. So long as you're actually putting your attention right into it as opposed to uh, having some load of thoughts about it. So for me, meditation became, as you said, very much part of my daily life. And it was two things. It was one, being anything I could do to be in the present tense and the other thing, to try to observe without getting sucked in. And I would do it, I started doing things like, um, every time I went to the bathroom, I'd spend an extra minute. Every time I sat in the car, I spent 30 seconds or a minute when I got in, when I was getting out. You know, every time I stood in front of the kitchen sink to wash stuff, I took 30 seconds. And you know, I just think gradually, they, those 30 seconds and so on, they just got a bit longer and they began to join up. And then they began to remind me, hey, you're falling out of present tense there. You know, and I remember the first few times that happened, being surprised at it. But that, and then it got to be quite long stretches of being in present tense or being out of present tense. So uh, it was part and parcel of daily life. It just became part of the everyday. And it started out with very small and very little. It was because I gave up on sitting on the cushion. I just realized that won't work. <coughs> Oh yeah, the, see the fourth one there, that's just what I talked about. Some technique to be used throughout the day as a, as a means of remaining, as a means of remaining in the present tense, whatever they are. And you know them as you begin to think, think of them. I mean, you know, just ask yourself, are you in the present? Uh, yeah. And self-inquiry, as in, as in questioning beliefs, looking for patterns of behavior, find and follow your fantasies. Um, when I used to hear the expression self-inquiry in the beginning, uh, I thought that that's some kind of an exotic thing. Again, I heard it first at Tat, oh, I do the self-inquiry. But looking back, actually, I had been doing it for years. And uh, one of the ways, one of the things that was very useful for me, getting a, a sideways look in at what was going on inside, um, well, I call them fantasies. You know when you'd have little movies running in your head? I know a lot of you have them. You didn't tell you didn't go tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I, you have to make a movie about the time you met somebody down the street and you just said whatever, but in your head, five minutes later, you've embellished it to, well, if I, I, I said this night, and wasn't I so clear, or wasn't I so funny, or whatever it was. The little fantasies. And uh, so I said, I must have heard somewhere that these little movies are these little fantasies. They're a really good clue as to what's going on. And at first, we kind of dismiss them. We don't think anything of them. But the first thing is, if there's a little fantasy going in your head, it's your fantasy. It's happening to you and, this, and to nobody else. It's important because it is happening to you and to nobody else and at this time. So you begin, you kind of begin to catch them. And um, so, so in the beginning, I couldn't see any point to them. Some of them were downright boring. <laughs> and they'd be, and not only would they run, but they'd be running again and again and again. And they were, I mean, they were, I don't know how long these would take. I never timed them because it'd be internal, but they might be 30 seconds or a minute. And um, what I eventually realized with them was they were always, I this, I that. There wasn't Tess, it was I. 
I'm saying this, I'm saying, and I'm laughing at how funny I was. You never see anybody go down the street with a smile on their face. You know, there's a whole front. Yeah, I see some of you know it. That's the thing to get. You can catch it. You see, if you feel a smile coming on your face and you're just going up the stairs, check back, come up front, that smile on you. And see, can you catch that little movie or that little fantasy? Yeah. And I found that once I began to catch them, then I began to be able to see them better. So observation of thoughts. Yeah. But that was a way to do it. And then, you know, other things I could even... And it, you know, it comes and goes. Sometimes I'd be, I would walk from my house to the shop with my dog. I would be so conscious when I was walking, I'd be observing. I'd hit the shop door and I'd go in. I would become completely unconscious, do my shopping shop and come out, and consciousness would come back. Our presence will come back. And this used to amaze me. The minute there was anybody else around, I was lost. Completely gone out there. But when I was on my own, I could. So I think a lot of time on your own, or a good bit of time on your own, gets that happening in you, so that it gets at least a, a bit of strength going. The sixth one I put there is prayer. Asking your inner guide for help and guidance in facilitating the dissolution of ego or false identification. The reason I put that there is because coming from my background, I grew up where we prayed for it to rain when it didn't rain. We prayed for it to stop raining. We said, Mass on Sundays, we, we prayed for it to stop raining so we could say to the hay, Martin Crosby knows about this. And I knew people who were praying to win the lottery or, you know, any kind of thing. And uh, I, I, so I, I couldn't do it. I always felt it was begging. You know, I, one of the, it was one of the things that, that turned me against Catholicism. I didn't feel it was right to be always asking for things for myself, and I didn't know how to do it. But again, I think it was at your website. Didn't you have an article on your website about prayer at some point? And I had been reading that, and I got, and it was something to the effect of prayer is effective when you ask f for the right kind of things. Yeah, with Douglas, Douglas Harding's. Was that what it was? Yeah. And I thought, okay. Okay, so it's a matter of the right kind. Now, what would be the right kind of thing? And somehow it became uh, that I would ask for, oh, please help me with this spiritual path. Now, I can also tell you, praying for me as time went on, especially towards the end, it wasn't, you know, please help me. It was, for Christ's sake, I go mad if you don't help me with this. And I remembered when I was a child, they used to say things like, you know, knocking on God's door, knocking. You can't just knock. Yeah, I'd have to break the place down. <laughs> and it, it got to me, I was banging on that door. I mean, I'm, I, I, if somebody, and it was if somebody out there, whatever, I don't even know if there's anything there, but by myself, I'm really lost. But that was towards the end. It had built up from, you know, saying, you know, I just want, you know, put, put the right books in front of me, put, you know, put the right teachers that I can trust with. So I had begun to ask for things like that. Um, and the other thing that I, I learned as I went along, prayer is a two-way thing. Mm. You can ask and you can receive. And that means you can receive messages and you can hear things. I think I, I would have found that for a lot of my life I didn't listen. I didn't know that I could listen. Um, and it could be, you know, and then you say, well, how do you listen? Where do you hear? Does a voice speak to you? Does God speak to you from the clouds? It isn't like that. But it might be something you've been asking what, for some kind of thing, and then the words of a song come up, and, and they surprisingly spot on to what, you know, they say something, or a, you find a book, or somebody gives you a book, and you're like, oh my gosh, this seems to be the very thing that I was wondering about. So, answers to prayers come not just from the voice in the sky or anything like that, but in things that happen and incidents and events and, and be open to opportunities. Have your ears and your eyes wide open for what opportunities might come. I think I would say before that my eyes and my ears were closed because I didn't expect so there's an opening. An opening with discernment. But you'll you'll get to know that in yourself, really, is what I would say. Um Solitary time or activities, a bit of gardening, walking, fire gazing. I'm still thinking of John Moriarty sitting looking into the fire every night. I grew up in this culture and I grew up with a fire a, fire a lot of times and sitting looking into the fire is real meditation. It's like a mantra. Watching the fire is like saying your mantra. Now if you're doing this for hours every evening and you know this is when the, the mind and the troubles of the day or the you know functioning of the day has passed, you're sitting in that space 
and things do have, and things from the, from the bottom have a chance to come up. Things that were buried way down begin to come up. But it's, a, you know, that kind, creating that kind of space in your life. Again, I had never had the idea of a solitary retreat until I went to Tash. And the, very, the first time I went there, I, I spent two days on my own doing solitary retreats. It was the first time in my life I had spent two days. And would somebody there just ask that person at the door? I, I, oh, I think it, no, it's, it's all right. She was looking in the window, but she's found to go the other way. We need to worry about her. And I went and I spent two days on my own. I spent lots of days and lots of time on my own, but it never struck me to not have a book to, you know, some kind of a novel to read or something, to actually have nothing, to do nothing, have as little as possible going on and see what happens. You know, I just hadn't heard the idea that that was a thing to do. And immediately I did that, something from my past <coughs> came up that I, I hadn't known or hadn't expected or whatever. And I thought, that's what happened. Things that were buried down there come up. So um, over the following year or 18 months, the only kind of solitary time I was able to get, I would get maybe two nights or three days. If any of my friends were going away, I would say, can I use your house for a couple of nights while you're gone? And it, it's good to get out of your own house. In your own house, you know, you'll see the window that needs to be cleaned or whatever. <laughs> but if you're in somebody else's house, that doesn't bother you. And it's in a quiet place. And after about four or five times doing that, Issues came up, like I had had a not such a great relationship with my father as a child. There were a couple of things about that. Uh, there were, you know, I had boyfriend troubles <laughs> as a teenager, shall we say, whatever. Some of those kinds of things came up. And after four or five weekends, maybe the sixth weekend I went, nothing came up. And here I am. There was silence. And I... Uh, it was kind of amazing. It was, it, it was internal and external. So uh, then I, I would have always brought a book with me and I would have been careful to bring something that would be considered good spiritual reading or, you know, art might well have said to me in a mail or something, you know, if I suggest this or that might be, or have you read something? And I would bring that. And I found when this silence would happen within me that whatever I read, it went right down in, into the centre of me. It didn't get stopped by thoughts or beliefs. There was no resistance. So it went, So these teachings, whatever it was, they would go right down. And I would never, I would find that I wasn't able to read an awful lot. It would be maybe a paragraph or a couple of pages, and then I would be just walking around or whatever. And I don't even think consciously digesting. I don't know. So that went on for the next couple of years. And what was amazing to me was whatever, it seems to have been whatever emotional issues or whatever were left, as soon as I got, gave myself a bit of solitary space, they sorted themselves out. They just came up. They just needed to be, and I didn't analyze them or anything. It was like as if I felt the hurt again. And they were all, for which of used to call afflictions to the ego. You know, it was like a willingness, to, a willingness to look at the afflictions to the ego. And once they were let come up and seen, knew what they were, and I would feel maybe the tension, or, the, or maybe one of the ones that came up above my father, tears came, and I imagine it was when I was a child and he said something. So the reaction I would have had as a child and suppressed it, it was like the suppressed bit was down there, and now when it was done, it finished itself off. You know, I, and that was it. And that seemed to be what happened with each thing, and then they were finished. No, it's very important what you say there, but it must be also part of your maturity in your work, because a lot of people spend a lot of time and money on psychology, psychotherapists for uh, solving what you are saying. You solve by. I spent thirty to forty years on the psychology. <laughs> yes, that's what before mean. I got to tell. I'm just telling you the tail end. I had done a lot of counselling and therapy and all the kinds of things that I had read in modern psychology. You know, I had been trying to do those, but I hadn't, that's why I said that the psychological phase, and then it became spiritual. So I'm saying that this, by this stage of it, I was doing it for the purposes of spiritual development. I was no longer trying to fix myself, to be yeah, a better functioning yeah. person. Yeah, exactly. That, yeah. There have been a shift, that's what yeah. I'm trying to yeah, talk about, that shift there. Yeah. The, the reason I was doing it, but